Theo Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome to the Old Time Radio Network Detective Stories, continuing America's love affair with private eyes. We now go back to the early days of radio and our imaginations with our feature presentation. We all know the stats. If a murder doesn't get cracked in the first week, it's probably not going to happen. Unsolved crime, cold cases. The Met's got more than its share, which is where we come in. It was a great speech. It was a pile of poo. <laughs> oh, don't hold back, Grace. On a sea of shit. It was a rubbish dump, <laughs> Frankie, and we were there for a reason. It was grandstanding, pontificating. Rotting fish and tampons. I smelt for weeks. Oh, <laughs> it was charismatic leadership. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So we go back through all the evidence, all the statements, every smallest detail from the last investigation. But we've got new weapons this time, new forensic expertise, DNA, psychological profiling. We sift through every layer. We dig into the past, we excavate, we find what has never been found. There's no such thing as an unsolved crime. Not anymore. There, and you pretended we'd never met. Come on, Grace, I gave you all a job. We had jobs. We'd known you for 15 right. years. We, we saved your skin, Lord. The Unforgiven by Barbara Machin. Fifteen years before, day one, Detective Sergeant Peter Boyd's story. February 10th, 1984. My house, my home, a raw winter's day, sleet dropping out of a snow-filled sky. You said you'd decide what we're doing for your birthday. It's bigger than I thought, but not in a party way. It's just a number, Pete. Forty. <laughs> it's more a question, like the road untaken. We could go away. I was thinking a retreat. Really? Would you mind? By yourself? Yes. Look, it, it's not religious, it's... It's, it's pretty selfish is what it is, and actually, Peter, it's the last thing we need. OK, great. Do that. Just assume the worst and don't ask me what or why or why now. In fact, don't ask me anything meaningful at all. Oh, God. Don't answer that. Why? Are you worried you don't know who it is? I was trying to explain. Hello? To describe how this was yes. about trying yes. to find my way back. Yes. But, as usual... The Commissioner wants to see you. And no, he didn't say. Look, Jen, covering stuff with more stuff isn't always Actually, the sometimes it is. It was snowing hard, ice on the road. I enjoyed the risk. I forgot about Jen. My heart raced. There are days when, despite it all, you're like an athlete on the blocks. The race mentally run, ahead of the pack, coming off the bend, already the winner. You're finished, Boyd. Sir? You run a fine line, but you just crossed it. Sit down. Well, I'd Sit, you arrogant bastard. 
You've heard that Eddie McTeers launched an appeal? No. That is insane, sir. He's as guilty as hell. You're guilty and dangerous, too. You're in deep. Up to your neck this time. I, I don't understand. So let me explain. Not a word I'm saying to you is official or can be repeated to anyone. No record, no recounting, no briefs, no mentions in any bloody book you ever write. If you disobey this, you are beyond finished. Sir. Edward McTeer's life sentence was life means life. He went down for the rape and murder of those five girls because we put him there. There's no way he can appeal. But he is, Boyd. He has, with the best QC in the land. In the name of justice, he's trying to free the most notorious killer we'll ever send down. And guess what? You've let him. No, hang on. Sit down, damn you. The fifth girl. Jilly. Jilly Bristow. He always denied her. There was incontrovertible evidence. He was linked to her and the others. The same fibres. We'll come to the damned fibres. First, the souvenirs. He always took one. Jewellery. Jilly wore a locket. We found it in the lining of McTeer's wallet. He says it was planted. No way. His brief says he has proof. Disclosure, then. What proof? Oh, don't worry. They assure us it's coming. I've already got chapter and verse on the fibres. He said things only her killer could have known. He taunted us. He was telling us... Come off it. You're justifying it. Fitting him up. No, sir. I saw them find the locket. What about the fibres? The sodding fibres linking him to the girl's jacket? Confirmed by forensics. They're saying the chain of evidence has been compromised. Talk to Mike Shule. He was my boss. I'm talking to you. McTeer had already confessed to four. Jilly was his last. But no body. We never found it. Mike Shaw's been on sick leave since last year, Boyd. He's a car crash, Alzheimer's, barely knows his own wife. McTeer's defence quotes all Shaw's case notes. He has you down for all the key evidence finds, including the girl's locket. No way. I didn't touch it. His word against yours. And they're saying they have proof. Look, if anything of this is true, it's down to Shaw. So prove it. The pre-hearing is in five days' time. If McTeer can prove he's been stitched up for Jilly Bristow, he'll walk for the lot. No way. Fitted up by cops. If they secure it for one, then the whole ship goes down. They'll savage us, Boyd. All his convictions will be declared unsafe. It's a nightmare. Think of those girls. Think of their families. Think of the total shame on the force. The <laughs> McTeer was found guilty. And unless you find the evidence you couldn't find before, the evidence that would not have required Shule or you or any plod and his gang to nudge the truth, unless you bring me that so I can make this go away quietly, you are done. Your job, your career, over. And you'll be facing a sentence of your own and you will go down. Five days. It was everything to do. And nothing. The sky was full of snow. Nothing looked the same. There was only one way out of this. And some one I had to ring first. Dr. Frankie Watson. Frankie. Sorry I can't or won't answer the phone. Oh, hell, Frankie. Today of all days, I needed you to be there. Yeah, well... It's been a long, short time. Oh, Boyd. This is going to be a shock, Frankie. This is something I never do. Never. God, for a moment, you know what? I actually thought... Usually I have the answer for everything, but this time... Frankie... I'm done. I'm... finished. I have to disappear. Maybe forever. And then he told me everything. The conversation he wasn't allowed to share with anyone. The desperation he decided to share with only me. Oh, Boyd. Jeez. I might be able to do as he says. Maybe against the clock find that evidence. Shut my tear up. But if I fail, they'll send me down. Cop like me, Frankie, I couldn't face that. I thought he's telling me this because he cares. Because that brief, sweet time actually did mean something. That we still do. 
I'm telling you this because I'm so sorry, Frankie. This trail of destruction might lead to your dog. No. I didn't know. I swear. Not like that. A sheet of fibers went missing for a day, and when it reappeared, I was instructed to hand it straight to you. Look, I worried, but I was told to get on with it. Look, no one had any doubts, Frankie. Matia was a guilty killer rapist. Crucial case files are in my attic. Go through them. My boss told me to disappear them, but I took them home. And yeah, then he said those words. And no, he hadn't ever said them to me before. But people say stuff when the chips are down, don't they? When they're desperate for help and they don't know how else to ask. They say those words. Dr. Grace Foley, please. I've got no idea. London somewhere. I ended up blagging her address off a mate. Grace was on leave. I'd never seen it snowing so hard. Oh, you mean Spencer. Spencer Jordan. Yeah, he always worked with Boyd, I think. I need to get hold of him. Well, he's a DC now. Of course I can ring him. And of course I'll help. You will? Why on earth would you do that? of your mercurial charm, no doubt, Frankie. Your total indifference to the sensibility of others. Sorry? People often think things, you know, and don't actually say them. Yeah, but it's just that I can't work out why... Boyd's been incredibly rude about profilers and said as much publicly, yes. I know. Hang on. This started off as my story. Uh, it was. But you'd done a runner, remember? Look, I'd done Grace a big favour. That's why she said yes. She owed me. Uh, nobody owed you that much, Boyd. She'd understand why I took the files home. Leave this to me, right? Just like you did. Five days. I know, it's impossible. Well, not necessarily. Can you grab my rucksack? Mm. Well, could you be camping? Yep. February in the snow. All of that. Greenham Common, the Blue Gate. Well, hang on, these are wire cutters. Yes, I'm very effective with wire security fences and padlocks. Dump all the stuff inside. Wow, big. It was my aunt's. She died last Christmas. Left it to me. Put the kettle on. I'll ring Spence. So you really drop everything? Yes, I would. But not for the same reason as you, Frankie. Well, my neck's on the line too. But that's not why, right? Oh, hello, uh, Spencer. He said he'd do his best. Frankie, will you please slow down? Oh, it's only snow. It's stupid people who can't drive. So does that mean he's in or out? Of course I remember you, Grace. We need you to lead this, Spencer. I'd be there in a heartbeat. You know I would. So that's a yes? I love the man, Grace, but he's always had this crazy streak. And there's something else. He was talking to me in his boxes and vest. He was buying a morning suit. So? He's getting married. So? Oh, in five days, Frankie. His fiance's away for work and she's left the entire thing to him. Yeah, but I thought Boyd was his man. Which is why, unbelievably, he will join us. He's finding a junior to help us. Oh, great. And now we've got some blabbing rookie to babysit. Oh, calm down, Frankie. Spencer knows the score. Well, when's he getting here? He'll meet us at HQ, but those fires at Boyd's are down to us. Great. Just great. Well, looks like someone's at home. His wife, Jenny. Look, you'll do this better than me, Grace. I'm a scientist, not a cop. You reap what you sow, Frankie. Come on. Clock's ticking. He 
He said he was coming straight back. Well, he's not now. Obviously, that's the problem. He's not? What do you mean? Why don't you come and sit down? The, the thing is, Jenny... Where's he gone? We don't really know. And he's in a bit of trouble. Tell me. It's an old case. There may be a problem. He didn't ring you. Obviously not. But he rang you. So why you? So we can try and sort it out under the radar. And we will sort it out. Which is, of course, what you have to say. Professional reassurance. Unwise, but effective to get me on side. Peter said he'd left some files in your attic. Would you mind if Frankie went up? And... Oh, go ahead. There's a fold-down ladder. Right, thanks. Are you a police officer too? No. <laughs> you imagine. A therapist. What does she mean he's not coming back? Of course he will. I'm sure. Which case is this? Which case? Edward McTeer, the Heathrow murders. I lost him to that for over a year. Giving that much of yourself to your job? It's a form of narcissism. Yes, yeah, you're probably right. But you'll like it too, right? Maybe it's the only way we can do our jobs. We're all on a spectrum. I'm more worried about our marriage than any stupid case. That's not what you want to hear, I know. I'm so sorry, Jenny. Look, let's get you through this first. Oh, Frankie? We've got half the police archive up there, Grace. Boxes and boxes. Mm. We're going to need to come back with a van. OK. Frankie? Have we met before? No. Peter must have mentioned you. I'll, um, I'll go and wait in the car, shall I? Yes, look, we'll, we'll come back shortly. I'm pregnant, you see. And he doesn't know? Perfect. I haven't had the chance to tell him. Which, of course, translates as I couldn't be sure he'd be happy, so I didn't dare. I'll take as much as I can carry. Frankie. Oh, I'm sorry, marriage guidance, not our remit. Frankie. There's a top latch, um, a deadlock. Pete's keen on security. Uh, your post, by the way, it's just arrived. Boyd's birthday next week, his 40th. Great, so we'll see you later then. Could, we, could I just have a look at that, the, the package? That's odd. Well, hang on, I'll do that. Whoa, 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 just put it down. Let me get my gloves. The address, his, his name in cut-out newspaper letters. Can I open it? Of course. Okay, something's wrapped. Looks like a book. And a card. D.S. Boyd, handwritten on the envelope. It's Boyd's book. Why send him his own book? Lots of pages marked up. It's his chapter on the McTeer case. Lots of lines highlighted. OK. A birthday card. Cheesy. Cottage, roses. To the one I love. Show me that. Oh, God, don't, don't move. Please don't touch them. What are they? Stupid metal wedding things, but if he's handled them without gloves, they could be prints. There's a signature. It says... Oh. It says, love, Jilly B. Oh, my God. Who the hell's that? <sighs> McTeer's fifth victim, Jilly Bristow. He went down for her and four other murders three years ago. I went straight to my lab. Spencer had arrived and taken over offices and set up boards. His gopher was a human blur. Blonde, too keen to be true. Too good looking for a career cop. But Spencer was all right. Old fashioned, warm, shook my hand. Hey Frankie. All right. He kissed Grace. Congratulations, Spence. Yeah, well done. Or whatever it is you say. Thanks Frankie. What? Well, nothing. I mean, it's a bit overrated, isn't it? Marriage? Yeah. <laughs> Frankie. I'll let you know. Anyway, uh, here's where I'm up to with the birthday card. Introductions first. Mel, my assistant, PC Mel Silver. Welcome, Mel, and thank you. I just want to say I totally understand the sensitivities. I mean, the confidentiality, the, the, the time scale. Yeah, five days, people, and we are halfway through day one. Mm. Sorry, of course. 
So, no prints at all on the card. He's forensically aware. I'm assuming it's a him. Saliva on the envelope? Actually, yeah. I rush tested it. That's incredible. Mm, that's running to the lab and finding the person who owes you the most. The sender is Blood Group B1. Hang on. Here it is. So is McTeer. Yeah, and so is 28% of the population. But McTeer is diabetic, and that shows up as an extra tag in his blood group. Finding tags takes longer, by the way. OK, so let's look at the rest. Grace, the cut-out letters, address thing? It's a flourish, a display. He wanted Boyd to be curious and open it straight away. The label, perishable, again, urgency. I'm a sick joke. Terrible pun? Probably. This guy's not unintelligent. The package is a pure piece of drama. OK, so the book stuff's obvious, yeah? He's telling Boyd the case he closed is not over. I'll go through all the underlines. Right, so the card itself. More of the same, and chosen carefully. A card from a dead girl, a sentimental cottage with roses round the door, a heaven on earth, when what he really means is hell. These are flower things stuck on. Decoupage. Can you take them off? Yeah, that was next. Here we go. Hang on, there's something handwritten here. It's a sort of rubberized glue. I can scrape it off. An address. Yes, Arnhem Way. Mel? On it. OK, now we're cooking. Let's get over there. This is his invitation. But why? Exactly. The why is everything. And so is the timing. This can't be a coincidence. To enhance the appeal? McTeer's engineered this to, to make himself look innocent? Possible, but unlikely. How do you know? I visit him every week. And trust me, he's a creepy little lowlife with the imagination of an earthworm. So who then? Fan? An obsessive? Someone who's read Boyd's book? All mcteer has been telling the truth. He didn't kill Jilly Bristow. So, this is the killer? OK, everyone needs a paper suit. And uh, load all my kit, please. Thanks. Um, Mel. Right. I was thinking I could make notes, collect the tapes. No, there's no need. OK, I'll timeline the Polaroids or whatever. So, back of the van, careful with the lights. OK. You can be so abrupt. Uh, kettle pot black, Boyd. We were in a hurry. You'd have moved the deal site quicker if you weren't always so anal. Paper suits, for God's sake. You were and are a philistine. Microscopic trace is hard enough without a team dumping debris. And where were you, Boyd? Uh, in hell, working through everything, coming up with the one key thing you needed to know. OK, Arnhem Way, West London. But it doesn't exist. It wouldn't get that wrong. OK, it was a row of terraced houses, but they were knocked down in preparation for the new ring road from Heathrow. I'm just on to uh, traffic. But isn't this just what he wants, us wasting our time? Let's concentrate on what we've got. Mel, yeah. I'll need all Boyd's files collecting from the house and all the exhibits from the murders. OK, right. Uh, yeah, thanks. Bye. OK, so a dozen houses were requisitioned, but it looks like they didn't actually get demolished. The new ring road was postponed. OK, let's go. Mel, slow down. Don't worry, she's fast car trained. This just gets better. Oh, for God's sake. Oh, Frankie, just a sec. I love the Bolero. Oh, didn't have you down for classical, Spencer. I'm not. It's my fiance. She's out there right now. The Winter Olympics. Oh, exciting. She does costumes for the figure skaters. Oh, that's amazing. Hang on, how on earth? I recognised her. She was stone cold sober and gave me a piece of her mind. <laughs> and her heart space. Oh, please. Yes, actually. And she might be taking it right back if I don't get the stuff ready for our wedding. Oh, Thanks, Frankie. Well, you better crack this case quickly so you can go and fold some doilies. You are so off the guest list. Thank God for that. Now, that really is a blizzard, so could we please slow down? The snow was unrelenting, turning to slush and slurry and drifts all along the West Way. Only one lane had turned black with salt, and the traffic ground onwards, bumper to bumper, a never-ending blur of brake lights. 
3.15 and nearly dark. Mel led us off the main drag through a maze of ghostly retail parks. Their outlines drifted, the security lights making cones of falling snow. Onwards, round the back of the storage warehouses, to a street cut off by a row of old concrete blocks. It was like a time warp back to East Berlin. This must be it. Right, you get started, boss. I'll go and find us some coffees. It's not a school outing, you know. And some sarnies. Oh, and a green tea and a rice cake for Frankie. Funny. Should we just get on? OK, on it. Cheer up, Frankie. It can only get worse. Whoever was doing this, keeping us uncertain was important to him. That way he could keep control. We walked on in silence. The snow couldn't cover the desperation. Traffic had cut this street off like a tide. Bleak lives had called these houses home and breathed the fumes of perpetual traffic every summer night. No roses round the doors. Hang on, Grace. Frankie was telling my story. Yeah, but this was my territory now. This place and how we'd all been brought here was all about the offender and his mind. We were about to walk into his story. Well, we haven't even got a number. How the hell are we going to find it? I think we'll know. She's like a retriever. <laughs> and so literal, she actually bought me rice cakes. Hang on. Oh, my God. What's that? Spencer, back here, quick. Look up there. A light just came on. Got it. It's the only window in the street not to be boarded up. Jesus, someone's up there. I mean, they've got to be. How else? Let's get in there. You get the sled down, Mel. Okay. Stand right back. If that doesn't work, well, I'll clear the snow off the doorstep. Okay, I'll leave it open if you could get the lock. I hate to spoil the moment, but there's a key under the mat. Right. Okay, stop. Stop. I want you all in suits before you go anywhere. For God's sake, Frankie. What if he's up there? Well, if he is, he's not going anywhere. And I don't want you and your size 12s contaminating evidence. They're all the same size. They are kind of. Huge and really huge. How like life. OK, we'll sweep the place first. I'm going with you. No way, Frankie. It could be dangerous, armed, anything. I'm not taking any chances. Stay on one route through the house. Remember where you've been. Mark it. Do not touch anything. God, talk to yourself, Frankie. There'll be no one there. Well, you're kidding. What about the light? This is far too elaborate to simply be leading us to him. This is about something he wants to show us. No one here. Nothing. Oh. It's OK. You can come up. Well, I need to do this systematically. Everyone follow behind me. Polaroid everything. Mel? Let's get the power on first. You found where the meat used to be, Mel? Right here. And the electricity feed into the house? Uh, this is it, I think. They can't just cut off a single street, so they just take away the access and the meter, but the power's still there, so if you have the know-how... We just need to bridge the gap between them. Have you done this before? And... Spence? Spencer? There. And no, I haven't, but it's how cannabis farms sort their heating problems. Are you sure there's no one up there? How did the light go on upstairs without power? It's a device. Two contacts join and the light switch is on. It's radio controlled. He triggered it, so he's somewhere near. He probably followed us, watched and chose his moment. We should put a call out. Oh, he's long gone. Job done. Yeah, but it tells us plenty. That sort of expertise is pretty specialist. He's probably services, ex-military... When did he plant it? Well, the package, the card, Boyd's book. This has all come together recently. Yeah, I don't want to hurry you. This is as important as forensics, Frankie. This is about what could happen next. He's been here recently and before the snow came. I've checked. There were no tracks at any level of each day's freezing, but his path inside is clear. He'd have broken cobwebs, trodden in dust. How long since anyone's been here? Well, it's three years since the girls died, since McTeer got sent down. It could easily be that. You better see upstairs. Recording this, Feb 10th, 1984, 5 Arnhem Way, house investigation. Okay, 
entering the first bedroom. Oh my God. Better let Grace see this. The bedroom had two single beds, one with clothing laid on it. All around on every surface, there were tin lids with melted candles and jam jars with what seemed to be dead flowers, all covered in a tilth of dust. Sick. Is this meant to be romantic? I think it probably was. What are you saying, Grace? I'm not sure. I need to see everything first. You've got the case notes, ma'am? Yeah. Um, right, victim one. Rose Gilcrest. Red sweater, grey skirt, black jacket with a mock fur collar, Doc Martin boots. These are them. Laid out as if she's about to get dressed. The boots tidily under the bed. Where's the underwear? Creeps too forensically aware to leave that. Where are the others? Look in the wardrobe. Yep, here we are. Jeans on a hanger. Check shirt, red gap sweatshirt, high tops, converse black. Sean Robinson, victim two. So why lay them out? Why take the risk? Because they haven't been left. They're on display. They're his trophies. But if this is staging, why wait three years? Show me the other bedroom first. Oh, wait, there's a bathroom. Oh, shit. Old gutted candles all around the bath. Red. Roses this time. Still in the supermarket wrapper. Yeah, but they're not important. It's what they represent. Well, I need them carefully bagged. I might get prints from the cellophane. Where are the clothes? Check the laundry basket. Oh, look at this. Maggie Furling? Show me the file now. Yeah. Yeah, these are hers. Look, there's her coat. Parker, hanging on the door. Walkman in the pocket. Outside it was still snowing, filling in our footsteps. It was like the house we could never leave. Next bedroom. It's Jade Singleton, victim four. Best coat and business suit, just home from holiday. Had vanished on her way back from an interview. More flowers, candles, and interesting. Half empty bottle of wine and two glasses. Only one glass used because, of course, only he drank. <sighs> okay, bag that glass. I've got loads to do. First, I need to tape and sample the carpets, then all the bed linen and get the clothes bagged and back at the lab. Everything, towels, tissues from the bins, all these stage props, even the water from the flowers. Right. You better see the kitchen. Fridge is full. Oh, gross. Everything's rotted down to liquid, but look, plastic sandwich packaging, bottles of water. All their bodies were found exactly five days after they disappeared. He kept them here. He had to feed them. Catering bags of coffee. Airport issue, obviously necked. But Matea didn't work at the airport. If Jilly Bristow was his fifth victim, where are her clothes? And what's this house telling us about the killer? Our killer chose it as a safe place to play out his fantasy with these girls. An illusion where they were there with him willingly as part of his romantic plan. But it's a sordid dump in nowhere land. Yeah, but that's not how it works, Mel. His own reality is all that's important. But all of this, he wanted to please. Well, the detail is all about his obsession, nothing else. The bedroom's full of flowers, the candlelight, they're cliches. They were all props to his internal world. They built the illusion and, crucially, 
stopped him feeling the horror of what he was doing. How could he pretend on any level? They'd been terrified. Well, their fear became part of his pleasure. And finally, it became too real, and they had to die. You really think Mittier's capable of this? He's no great thinker, is he? Sexual sadists aren't necessarily bright or imaginative. They're built for purpose. But, I agree, this feels odd for Mactir, and that worries me. We were all worried. I was carrying away enough work for months while our deadline ticked like a bomb. What's going on? Look, up over by the cars. Tell me it's not what I think. Oh, no. Let me handle it. For a moment, they were a mass seething round our vehicles and arguing with the cops called to secure the building. And then they were running straight at us. No, excuse us. I can't answer any questions at this stage. What brought you here? We all received anonymous calls to our news desks. So hand over any recordings of that call to PC Silver. He said you'd find the missing girl, Jenny Bristow. I can't discuss anything with you. So is that a yes? That's a no comment. Move right away from my officers. Now please go. One man didn't. He just stood there. Mr Bristow. <laughs> Jilly's dad. He'd come to our offices every week for three years and he'd haunted me on the days between. He wanted the one thing we couldn't give him. I'm so sorry, Clive. <laughs> Is it her? Come on. <laughs> we'll get you home. It's okay. It was almost nine. Pizza had come and gone. I could see the others through my lab window. No one was going home. How are you doing? Well, I've taped and analysed all the carpet fibres to cross-reference with trace found in the murdered girl's hair or on their bodies. But there's one strange fibre I can't work out. I found it on the carpet everywhere. I mean, it's obviously been carried in on a shoe tread. I've just checked the original trace cards, but it isn't there. You think it was carried in after he got rid of them? Can you get me the floor plans of the house, the garden, the land round it? Sure. Mel? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. OK, so we've got the detailed assessment back from the saliva on the birthday card envelope. It does not have the diabetic tag, so not material. Well, it doesn't rule him out, though. He could have still organised it, you know, like a puppet master. Just get me those house plans, will you? She's trying her hardest, Frankie. Oh, no, we're against the clock, and there are too many theories and not enough facts. And not enough sleep. Couldn't help noticing the camp bed in your office. Oh, it's just for the odd night when I get too busy. And the suitcase? Thank you for caring, Grace. But try not to ask, OK? okay. It's just an accommodation glitch. This is the original fibre research. You know about this stuff, Grace? Kobeck sheets? Kind of. Continuity of the evidence is crucial, so each page of fibres found has a number they can be logged and traced back. OK, pages 1 to 10. Fibres found on the bodies of Rose Gilchrist, Sean Robinson, Maggie Thurling and Jade Singleton, mainly in their hair. The heads were forensically well preserved. They were wrapped in cling film. Which wasn't necessary for disposal, so it was signature, something he uniquely needed to do for him. We restricted all detail of that sort to protect against copycats. But every girl had her teeth smeared with lipstick. Their own? No, always gloss carmine red, a type no longer made. Oh, all pre-planned then. And for him, that act held huge personal significance. And the hair was cut, hacked off roughly. Predictably, I found plenty of cut hair today. Did you find Jilly's? No. Nope. 
The cut hair clearly belonged to each of the girls found, all dark. Jilly was the only blonde. No blonde hair at all? No, none. And here's the worry, Frank. The fibre evidence is one of the main struts of McTeer's appeal, so let's go through this, Mel. Right. Uh, the numbered Kobet sheet show the same spectrum of fibres all found on the four girls which link them to McTeer's clothing and an unknown location. That's this house, yeah? Absolutely. The carpet, the bed linen, it all fits. And here's the card relating to Jilly Bristow. Her body not found, of course, but her discarded jacket was in a car park. You examine it and confirm fibres from McTeer's clothing, thus linking him with her. There was no other conclusion. But you didn't notice that the card's number didn't match the evidence log and that one card from the original run of ten was missing. No, I didn't. It looks like this card was given a false number and possibly had Jilly's jacket fibres added to it in order to create the link whoa, whoa, with McTeer. I would never. I did not. But someone did, Frankie, and then you confirmed it. This is what Boyd was warning you about. You should have checked the log. He wouldn't have given me dodgy evidence. Well, he might have suspected something was not right. So he should have done something. It's not always that easy, Mel. If his boss was sure McTeer had killed Jilly and was skewing evidence, there'd be little he could have done. Noble cause. It was common enough. Oh, his book doesn't say any of this. Oh, come on, how could it? Well, it's always easier looking back. What, so he ignored stuff? I had suspicions, but I couldn't check them out. Things were moving too fast. My boss resented anything I did. He threatened suspension for insubordination. Cognitive dissonance. We make mistakes or we are forced to, and in order to live with that, we create protective fictions, and that keeps us safely on course. And they found Jilly's locket in McTeer's wallet. We need to look at that too. Boyd's name was down in the log as having found it. Well, there's being used and there's deliberate cheating. Boyd would not have planted evidence. Which is why we're all here. Right. Even if Boyd's boss was dodgy, if McTeer is guilty of Jilly Bristow's murder, and if we can prove it, we can clear Boyd and make this right. OK, thank you. Here are the plans of the house and the whole terrace. Oh. Hang on. This shows the houses all have attics. There was no sign of a trapdoor. That fibre I found. It could be fiberglass. Loft insulation. He yeah. covered the trapdoor. It was nearly midnight. We had finally stopped snowing. The temperature was plunging. The perpetual ring road droned and glowed. The snow had frozen hard. We stumbled into our old tracks. Mel broke into the house next door. She and Spence ran up the stairs. We saw their torches in the top windows. OK, let's move. The ladder folds upwards. He must have papered over the trap door. And then we were back in that dark and terrible house. Our breath ghostly in the torchlight. The cries no one could possibly have heard were behind every door. Light, please, Mel. OK. Help me, yeah? Yeah. Uh. This is it. We found it. Jilly's room? And that's when he saw... Oh, hell. ...what would change everything. In episode one of The Unforgiven by Barbara Machen, Boyd was played by Anthony Howell, Grace by Sue Johnston, Frankie Holly Aird, Mel Claire Goose, Spencer Will Johnson, Jenny Amelia Laudell. The commissioner was Clive Hayward and the journalist Ryan Early. The Unforgiven was directed by Allegra McElroy. <laughs>